In this lecture, we look at Euler's marvelous formula. The complex system is an extension of the real number system. The theory of complex numbers unifies the mathematical number system and explains, in fact, simplifies many mathematical phenomena. It is within the theory of complex numbers that a variety of mathematical problems are best explored and solved. To do the complex numbers, we introduce a number i defined to satisfy the equation i squared is minus 1. The complex numbers are then defined as all numbers of the form a plus bi where a and b are real. So we write the set of complex numbers as a plus bi, a and b are real numbers, and a complex number of this form is said to have real part a and imaginary part b. Any number that we use in mathematics in general can be written in this form. We'll, we'll view as a complex number. The number i has real part 0 and imaginary part 1. It's said to be purely imaginary. The number 5 has imaginary part 0 but real part 5. The real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. The real numbers are those complex numbers in which b, the imaginary part, is 0. The introduction of the number i occurred as the 0 of the polynomial x squared plus 1. And that automatically gives us two zeros for that polynomial because both i and minus i are zeros of x squared plus 1. Algebraically, these two numbers i and minus i are indistinguishable. Mathematically, we may describe this ambiguity between i and minus i as a field automorphism, exchanging i and minus i. The map that replaces a plus bi by a minus bi is called conjugation. The conjugate of the complex number a plus bi is z bar, which is a minus bi. Thus, the conjugate of 2 plus i is 2 minus i, the conjugate of i is minus i, and the conjugate of 5 is just 5. The complex numbers have a natural algebra involving the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. The first three operations in this list the algebra is rather obvious and automatic. There is a subtlety when we try to do division if we're trying to put complex numbers back in rectangular form a plus bi. In this case, we need to use conjugation to do the division. If I give you a complex fraction, multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator and simplify. The value of complex numbers was recognized but poorly understood during the late Renaissance period, during the 1500s, in Italy. The number system itself was explicitly studied during the late 18th century, late 1700s. Euler, in fact, used i for the square root of minus 1 in 1779, and Gauss used the term complex in the early 1800s. The geometry of the complex plane, sometimes called the Oregon diagram or the Gauss plane, was introduced in 1806. So most of our understanding of the complex numbers occurs across the last two centuries. But around 1740, the young mathematician Leonard Euler proved the following result. If you're willing to work with complex numbers, then for any real number theta, the exponential form e to the i theta is also equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is a remarkable result comparing identifying an exponential function with trig functions and explain the number of mathematical phenomena. Up until then, there have been some observations that exponential functions sometimes acted like trig functions and vice versa, and this explains why. Notice the following remarkable fact. For example, if I take this complex number, root 3 over 2 plus 1 half i, which is the cosine of pi over 6 plus i sine pi over 6, and I cube it, if I multiply it out, I end up getting i. And if z cubed is i, then z to the 12th is 1. And so z is the so-called 12th root of 1, or 12th root of unity. If you take that number z above and you raise it to the 12th power, you get 1. It's easy to see this if we think in terms of Euler's formula. The polar coordinate form for the po this point in the plane is r equals 1. It has modulus or length 1 and theta equals pi over 6. It's at the angle 30 degrees in the complex plane. So this element z is exactly 1 12th of the way around the unit circle. z is a 12th root of 1 and is 1 12th of the way around the unit circle. This is not a coincidence. The geometry of the complex plane 
gives us algebraic properties. Why does this happen? Well, de Moivre, before Euler, around 1700, was willing to work with something he called the square root of minus 1, and he was playing around with trig function, and he observed this fact, that if you take cosine theta plus the square root of minus 1 times sine theta, and you raise it to the nth power, it's just as if you had multiplied the angles by n. You suddenly got cosine n theta plus square root of minus 1 times sine n theta. Thus, exponentiation, raising to a power, is equivalent to multiplying the angles by that number n. Somehow the angles in the complex numbers act like exponents, and this is what Euler discovered. Euler took de Moivre's formula and played with, with it some more, using his understanding of, of limits. Euler's ancient argument used de Moivre's formula, um, which we're going to assume for the moment. Uh, de Moivre did prove this. Um, and it was published um, in the early 1700s. The way Euler came at that is he had been investigating this constant that occurs when you take 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power as n goes to infinity. We now call this constant e. It's a limit as n goes to infinity of this expression. With a computation or two, Euler recognized that if instead of taking 1 plus 1 over n to the n, you take 1 plus x over n to the n, as n goes to infinity, you get e to the x. So you can think of the exponential function as being a result of this limit. Euler also observed that if x goes to 0, then cosine x goes to 1, and if x goes to 0, sine, over, sine of x over x goes to 1. These are some standard early limits we discover in a calculus class. Euler discovered them around 1735-1740. Now these last two expressions he wrote not using a, a limit as something with the 0, but a limit using infinity. And the way he thought of that was instead of looking at x, he looked at x over n, and he let n go to infinity. There's an error here. This it should be n going to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity of cosine x over n is 1 because x over n is going to 0. And in the same way, instead of looking at the limit as x goes to infinity, he looked at the limit as n goes to infinity of sine x over n over x over n, and he got 1. In both cases, the bottom limit down there in equation 5, it should be n going to infinity, not x. Euler got these limits, and he had the other limit describing an exponential function, so here's what he did. This, now, this work was done before the concepts of limits were fully formed, and so Euler did not really write out limit notation. Instead, he just said, if n is infinite, then here's what happens. If n is infinite, then 1 plus x over n to the n is e to the x, we would now think of it as a limit. If x is in, infinite, Euler said, then the, this is true. And since sine x over n divided by x over n goes to 1, then sine x over n must be equal to x over n. Then Euler looked at de Moivre's law, and he replaced the n theta by x so that theta became x over n. So he took de, de Moivre's formula. On the right side, you see those n thetas. He wrote x's instead. And if n theta is x, then theta is x over n. So you can rewrite de Moivre's formula this way. So de Moivre's formula gives us this one. And then Euler looked at this some more and said, well, if n's infinite, or well, if n goes to infinity, then the side on the left, I can replace cosine x over n by 1 and I can replace sine x over n by x over n, and I can write this expression. But what is 1 plus x over n to the n when n goes to infinity? That's e to the ix. And so we now have the formula that's named after him, e to the ix equal cosine x plus i sine x, Euler's identity. I'll tend to emphasize the trigonometry involved by instead of using x, I'll use the angle theta, and so there is Euler's formula. Now, Euler's argument plays a little fast and loose with the limit concept. It took uh, the modern, it took mathematicians another century before they began working well with limits. But Euler's formula can be fixed by being careful with our limits, and um, there are many applications of it. We'll explore some of them in the next lecture.